absence was the new mantra, and music followed the trend. One of the funny things, or paradoxical things, of a number of the successful songs of the early 50s is that they're written by Tin Pan Alley veterans. It is almost a dumbing down of the kind of skills that seemed called upon in the most successful and the most lauded of the earlier popular uh, music associated with Tin Pan Alley. There was this almost throwing out of some of those rules and just going for something which was going to be almost mindless. The old Tin Pan Alley certainties of quality songs for quality singers was no longer generating enough sales for the record companies. Enter Mitch Miller, the first of a new breed we now call the record producer. What I was thinking, I want to make the picture alive through the listener's ear. You wanted to have catch their ear in the first four bars. So that somebody liked it enough so that they wanted to buy it. And to buy it, they meant to play it over and over again. Like kissing. You don't kiss once and say that's enough for the night. You know? <laughs> and, and in a way, it's, it's love making to the audience with music. Miller's choice of material often frustrated artists, like aspiring jazz singer Frankie Lane. He called me from New York, he says, he always called me Daddy-O. He says, Daddy-O, he says, I got a follow-up hit. And he played it for me on the phone. I said, oh, Jesus, Mitch, if I do that, I'll lose every jazz fan I've ever had. He says, yeah, maybe so, but you'll pick up a lot of fans who aren't listening to you now. Well, that impressed me. All, all up along, the focus was on the song itself. And in the 1920s, say, if My Blue Heaven was the big hit, you might have bought the record, but chances are you bought the sheet music and you went home and played it on your piano, even if you were a lousy piano player. You could still essentially get you know, My Blue Heaven in your home played by you on your piano. Whereas by the time of something like Mule Train, if you liked that song, it just made no sense to go out and buy the sheet music and try and play it, because there was no way you could replicate anything like that. Anything you could do on the piano would just be, you know, ridiculous. Mule Train, clearly clapping over heel and plain. Seems as how they never stop. Clippity clap, clippity clap, clippity, 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 clippity. Before this, when people went in to record, it was really a record, like a document of what they did on stage, what a dance band did in a ballroom, or what Al Jolson sang on stage, or uh, even Bing Crosby, too. Um, so they were just capturing a sound that was you heard in real life. The whole thing that I think Mitch brought about was the idea of uh, that a record could be something and you know an end into itself you know the whole idea now is to sell these singles and and the single is is, is the product itself Clearly clapping through the wind and rain they'll keep going till they drop clippity clap clippity clap clippity 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 clapping along miller was a classical musician who brought a whole new palette of orchestral instruments into the pop studio that had never been heard there before Timpani, harpsichords, and even bagpipes. The weirder the better, so long as it hooked the ear of the listener. Mitch was one of the earliest guys to realize that um, if you're trying to make records that are going to radio play, you have to come up with something that's going to grab the listener within a, a few seconds, you know, 10 seconds at most. Come on to my house, my house, I'm gonna give you candy. Come on to my house, my house, I'm gonna give you apple, plum, and a bomb. When I did Come On To My House, I heard it on an obscure label in a wholly different version. And it gave me the idea to do it with Rosemary Clooney with a harpsichord. Come On To My House hits you with everything it's got in the first, you know, five seconds. You got this incredibly catchy beat, you've got this really kind of silly, fun lyric, and you've got harpsichords, and it's kind of, it's kind of highbrow and lowbrow at the same time because you have all these classical instruments going on. There's no way it couldn't have grabbed you. Come on to my house, my house, come on. Come on to my house, my house, I'm gonna give you candy. 
Come on, my house, my house, I'm gonna give you peach and pear and I love your hair. Well, look, you're gonna eat the same menu every day? You're gonna eat steak and potatoes every day? You're gonna eat McDonald's every day? You want something different for you here. A change, a change of menu. Come on, my house. Miller's quest for a new modern sound took him to some strange places. Can you hear the echo in here? All right, see. It wasn't my idea. I just said to Bob Fine, a legendary engineer, put a halo around the voice. All the records of pop singers sound like they're singing through a hunk of wool. And next thing you know, the next session we had, he, he rigged up a microphone, going to a toilet and and he had a loudspeaker in the toilet and he had a microphone with a line coming back and so he take the original sound and just crack in some of the sound here so everybody sounds vibrant in the bathroom and they're, oh, I sound like an opera singer I end up being Pavarotti eh? And for, for months, other record labels went crazy. They didn't know how we did it. <laughs> of course, when the word got out, next thing you know, you had echo chambers. And, but the original echo chamber was a toilet. You know, the, the Mitch Miller sound was, you know, something that was like, like uniform. It almost didn't matter who the singer was because the production became much more important. And if it had, you know, Rosemary Clooney's voice on it or Tony Bennett's voice, so much the better. But you know, you could pretty much tell it was a Mitch Miller production even before the singer started. TV was the latest luxury for the family to share. Replacing radio as the medium for music with broad appeal. Pop vocalists like Perry Como, Rosemary Clooney, and Frankie Lane all hosted their own primetime shows. If ever a pair of eyes promised paradise, deceiving me, grieving me. If television offered a home to Timpan Alley, radio was now the place to find the more niche music associated with America's different regions. It spoke to quite separate audiences. For the many different genres of music, that were unlikely to find a home on network television or in the national pop charts. If you liked hillbilly music, it was called, there was a hillbilly chart, and there were records that were just made for uh, the country and Western audiences. And if you lived in, in New York, it was very unlikely that you would be able to even, you know, buy a country Western record because they just weren't sold in New York. And if you lived in, in the white areas in New York, you'd have to go up to Harlem to, to buy a race record, to buy a Nat King Cole trio record or something like that. They're separate. And, and, and to a degree, you wouldn't even know that these other kinds of music exist. What starts to happen, thanks to Mitch Miller in particular and other people, uh, is that things from like the folk genre and, and the country genre gradually come over. Tennessee Waltz the first sign that country music is becoming more and more important. And the Patti Page record of it is just about the biggest selling single of all time after White Christmas. I was dancing with my darling to the Tennessee Waltz when an old friend I happened to see. We have to remember, too, a good part of the dominant record industry and music business as a whole at that point in time. Country music is still being seen as, to remember one of its early less than, than friendly designations, is shit kicker music. You know, it's music for hillbillies and rednecks. This is the best song we've ever had uh, financially. A tune called Cold, Cold Heart. <laughs> I was a big fan of Hank Williams, and country music was just not being done in the big metropolitan areas. 
And I brought Mitch a song called Cold, Cold Heart. Play eight bars of Hank Williams you know, with the scratchy fiddler. And, uh, he sings great, and it's a strong. I try to, why don't you free my doubtful mind and melt your cold, cold heart? Wow, there's a, no better two lines ever written by. And uh, when Jerry Wexler told me about it, he said, listen. So I immediately thought of Tony Bennett. And I played, a, played the Hank Williams record for Betty. And he said, oh, you don't want me to do those cowboy songs? <laughs> I said, Tony, don't listen to the arrangement, listen to the words. And, and he did, of course. It was a big, big hit. I tried so hard, my dear, to show that you're my every dream. Yet you're afraid each thing I do is just some evil scheme a memory that was mitch miller he was the first one to tap into country where no one else any any of the cities they wouldn't they just said what are you doing you know and mitch had, did have the foresight to actually say this is where it's happening and we we put a big string orchestra behind cold gold art and and in about two months, it ended up selling. In those days, it was a, a huge. It sold two million records. What you're getting is you're getting this style of song, grassroots, we'll call it, filtered through the popular singing styles of the Patty Pages, of the Doris Days, of Tony Bennett. You're getting it filtered through people who had come up through the big bands, who had learned, been trained to sing in the popular style but are singing songs from below, are singing the country songs. The raw material, some would say in Tin Pan Alley, the sewage is about to come through, but it's being treated, it's going through a treatment process, uh, the syrupy process, perhaps. The more I learn to care for you, the more we drift apart. These country boys had very, very simple harmonies and chords because they were singing simple songs about life. And life is simple, life is direct, life is about good and bad and jealousy and hate and rage and love and joy and things like that. I got this call from Hank Williams and he said, Tony, I said, Mr. Williams, what is it? He said, What's the idea of ruining my song? <laughs> and uh, he was just kidding around, actually. He liked it. I think this erosion between musical genres that one sees in this early crossover material is providing kind of the bedrock for what is going to be in several years rock and roll. The ironic thing is that Mitch Miller claims to hate rock and roll, and, and I'm sure he's sincere in that, but of course he created it. I mean, that whole rock and roll could not have existed had he not been doing what he you know, was doing for 10 years before it. I mean, there were no producers who would have gone in the studio and, and used all the tricks that he invented, the echo chambers and the, the sound effects and all the, and, and the overdubbing and stuff like that. I mean, that all exists because of Mitch, and there certainly couldn't have been any rock and roll without him. Go to town and marry Bon Uncle John He claimed he has a music, but he's having a lot of fun, oh baby Once this high-energy new music began kicking down the doors, the teenage dollar started talking, and supply quickly followed demand. Rock and roll was taking over the music business. The older generation of professional songwriters was outraged. Halfway down Broadway, the Brill Building had housed some of the greatest of Timpan Alley songwriters. Here, the music establishment had always prided itself on being able to spot musical trends and lead musical taste. Tin Pan Alley was very upset with this. The Tin Pan Alley songs, songs that originated in the East, particularly in New York, were no longer hitting the top of the hit parade, were no longer selling many copies. It was rock and roll. Tin Pan Alley responded, really, by, by a kind of hostility. There was no real policy about it, but certainly there's a kind of, they all got their backs up, uh, Irving Berlin. I mean, all the old traditional writers were incredibly hostile to it. Frank Sinatra was constantly denouncing rock and roll. 
in one way or another. They felt that, that somehow the musical heritage that they represented was, was being flushed away by 